thousands of sticklebacks every year uh, for ecological studies. Okay, so we've got all sorts of different traits that are uh, segregating in these wild populations. I want to talk about the genetic basis of some of the differences, and we'll start um, by talking about the lateral plates. This is one of the major morphological differences that's evolved repeatedly in uh, different, different uh, locations. This uh, image is actually taken from an old uh, monograph by uh, the famous French naturalist Cuvier, who several decades before the origin of species gave different species names to marine and freshwater forms of sticklebacks because of the dramatic changes uh, in bony patterns. The marine form is shown on the top with plates from head to tail. Freshwater form is shown on the bottom. Many of the freshwater forms have lost a lot of the armor plates, uh, retaining them only at the front or having very few plates at all. Again, this is thought to be uh, almost a military decision about the best kind of armor to have in particular environments. You can either be heavily armored and slow or lightly armored and fast. So there's a higher burst swimming speed in the low-plated sticklebacks. Depending on the predators that are chasing you, it may be better to have one form or the other. Okay, now, we can do for sticklebacks exactly the sort of genetic archaeology experiment that we described before for maize and tiacente. So take a marine form and a freshwater form that look very different in the number of plates, 35 or 36 plates in the marine fish shown on the left, only a single plate left uh, in one of these freshwater populations from uh, Paxton Lake near Vancouver. Generate an F1 hybrid generation, intercross the F1s to generate the F2 grandchildren that are uh, putting back together in various chromosome combinations all of the marine and the freshwater chromosomes, then go in count armor plate numbers in all of those uh, F2 offspring, isolate DNA samples, type them with a set of genetic markers that we've developed for genome-wide linkage mapping in sticklebacks, and then look to see whether there's particular chromosomes that always go together uh, with particular traits. When you do that, what we found was that there's a single major gene on the distal end of uh, linkage group 4 that controls about 70% of the variation in armor plate number uh, in the cross. So a very large genetic effect. It's not as simple as a Mendelian trait. There's also uh, chromosomes that have smaller quantitative effects on plate number. So we call these modifier genes, quantitative modifiers. They may each control somewhere between 5 and 10% of the variation in armor plate number uh, in the cross. Okay, so in many ways, these results are very similar to what I described before uh, for doing this kind of experiment in maize or tiacente. As in maize and tiacente, it's also possible once you've identified one of these chromosome regions to go into that region, sequence all of the DNA in that area, and decode uh, the actual genes that are in that region that may be controlling uh, the traits. We've been able to do that for this major gene region that controls armor plate number in sticklebacks and been able to identify a single signaling molecule gene that plays a key role in armor plate formation. The easiest way to demonstrate that it plays a key role is to reintroduce that gene into uh, eggs from low-armored fish. So you can uh, directly inject fertilized eggs from low-armored fish uh, with the gene from the chromosome region that controls armor. And when you do that, you put armor plates back on the sides of the stickleback. So again, very like the kinds of single-gene experiments that have been done uh, for corn and diacente. And the conclusions are very similar. Single genes can control uh, major morphological differences now in these populations that have evolved in natural environments. Okay, there's actually um, talk about uh, one other trait, which is the presence or the absence of the hind fin. Fish are like most land animals. They have four major uh, fins, uh, appendages or limbs. Two uh, fore fins or pectoral fins and two hind fins or pelvic fins. These uh, traits get modified in some of the fish populations. And we think that the presence or the absence of the hind fin is actually a very interesting sort of trait because it's the same kind of trait that's evolved repeatedly in a whole range of different animals. Of course, snakes and some reptiles uh, have evolved major limb reduction. They've lost both their forelimbs and hind limbs. Whales and uh, some aquatic mammals like um, manatees have evolved hind limb reduction. They still retain four fins or flippers, but they've lost uh, the hind fin. And pelvic or hind fin reduction also occurs both in fossil sticklebacks and uh, in some living populations Again, uh, in those special populations that have decided to lose their hind fin, it's thought to be uh, a likely adaptation uh, to particular predator environments. If you're a fish that's evolving in an environment where there aren't any trout trying to eat you, so you don't need the, uh, to erect spines to try to avoid a trout, 
but you are being uh, chased by insects, it may actually be good to lose some of these uh, structures uh, that the predators try to grab onto. So I'll show you a little bit higher resolution look at the hind fin of a stickleback uh, in this short video. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the stickleback skeleton uh, created by Craig Miller in my lab based on uh, a micro uh, x-ray approach. You can see the armor plates that we talked about before along the sides of this marine fish. And then colored in red, you can see the pelvic apparatus, which consists of this spine that projects from the side of the animal. Uh, it articulates in a ball and socket joint with this underlying pelvic structure, which is shown in red, wrapping around the side and on the ventral surface of the fish. The fish can actually raise and lower those spines. Uh, that's, so then the, the pelvic fin consists of the spine and this underlying uh, pelvic bone. Marine fish always have the pelvis, the form shown at the top, pelvis highlighted in red in the middle. But again, some of the freshwater populations uh, have evolved the complete elimination of, uh, of the hind fin, like the Paxton Lake uh, shown at the bottom. So what is the genetic basis of completely losing a limb uh, in natural populations? Again, we can use exactly the same sort of genetic archaeology approach, measuring now uh, the presence or the absence of the hind fin in these crosses between marine and freshwater fish. When you do that, it turns out, and we get a result that should be uh, now sounding familiar, there's a single major gene that maps to the distal end, this time of linkage group 7, that controls about two-thirds of the variation uh, in pelvic size in the F2 progeny from this sort of cross. Once again, it's not uh, Mendelian, so there are a series of chromosomes that have smaller quantitative effects and control maybe 5 to 10 percent of the variation uh, in pelvic size. So again, more complicated than Mendel, but even the presence or absence of an entire uh, limb or fin here is being controlled by a relatively simple uh, genetic system, just as we saw before for major transformations uh, in both corn and in dogs. So I think it is amazing what can be done by simply selecting and accumulating uh, genetic variants. Artificial selection has transformed Tiacente into maize and transformed uh, wolves into a diversity of different dog breeds. But natural selection can generate equally large changes in completely wild animals that are adapting to the kinds of environmental changes that occur all the time uh, in the history of the Earth. So one of the conclusions of this sort of uh, genetic work is that it doesn't take that long to generate uh, really major changes in plants and animals. So all of the changes that we've talked about have been generated uh, in the last 10,000 years or so. That's just a blink of the eye compared to the long geological eras that uh, Sean summarized in, in, in the first lecture. So how uh, can things go so fast? Part of the answer is that single genes have big effects, right? So we saw that for uh, the genes that control the fruit cases in corn or the branching pattern in corn or the leg length uh, in dogs. So those are all examples of artificial selection. Exactly the same thing we've seen uh, in some of the genetic analysis of natural selection. So major genes that control armor plate numbers or uh, presence or absence of a hind fin, or in the case that Sean mentioned this morning, uh, whether you're a black or a light-colored uh, rock pocket mouse, another example of natural variation. The other thing that helps the speed is that it doesn't take very long for selective pressures to increase the frequency of an advan advantageous allele once the mutation has occurred, even at random. Sean showed you this morning that that's true for the case of coat colors uh, in pocket mice, 1%, 5% selective advantage, and pretty soon, whatever the gene is that controls that trait spreads rapidly uh, through the population. I think that's likely to be true not just for coat colors, but for a whole range of different traits. I think one of the striking things about the sticklebacks is that all sorts of things have changed in the last 10,000 years. Skeletal traits, feeding traits, traits related to mating and reproduction and whether fish are even compatible uh, to mate with each other. All sorts of physiological differences and behavioral differences. So I think that the principles that Sean outlined this morning, how one gene could sweep to produce a color change uh, in a thousand years or less, is actually an example of selection that's occurring for multiple traits simultaneously, even in natural environments. There's all kinds of challenges out there uh, in the changing world, and the process of random variation followed by selection.